get away with a legend. Well, he was certainly, if not the most popular, he was certainly one of the most popular figures this country has ever had in boxing. And of course, he fought like a tiger. He just tore into anybody. It didn't matter who the opponent was. Freddie was in there from the start and attacked. He didn't know how to go backwards. And people love that. I mean, they love extroverts and they, they love courageous fighters. Uh, and Freddie was both of those. <laughs> Though he lived for much of his life in South London, Freddie Mills was born and brought up in Bournemouth, a place seen far more as an embodiment of suburbia by the sea than a breeding ground for world champion boxers. Somehow, of all the places Freddie Mills might have come from, Bournemouth would be about the last you'd think of. It's almost as though his hometown embodied the very reverse of his own remarkable qualities. It stands for everything that's genteel, decorous, and non-violent. Whereas Freddie seemed the essence of the big city street fighter. Rugged, fast-talking, and one of the most belligerent men ever to step into a boxing ring. Bournemouth today seems positively racy compared to the suffocating respectability that was its hallmark in Freddie Mills's youth. But even then, the town had its less conventional side, including the Mills family. Otherwise, Freddie and his sister Sissy, okay. who still lives in Bournemouth, yes. grew up as the children of a scrap metal dealer. But it was their older brother Charlie, not their father, who introduced Freddie to boxing. By the time Freddie was eight, Charlie was a semi-professional. At home in Terrace Road, Sissy found that her influence was waning. Him and I were very, very close until he was about eight. So all of a sudden he had this boxing craze, didn't he? And then Charlie encouraged him to go boxing. And then in the end, my father had a huge shed at the back of the, the house. And they opened, they made it into a gym, didn't they? Made it into a gym. And they used to get in there every night sparring. And that was it. That was his beginning. I worked for the dairy and he used to come along on Saturdays and sort of help me. He used to enjoy that because we used to have to push the mill, you know, push the cart round and he used to do that go in and out of the houses for me. And he thought this was great. Well, I'd probably give him a copper or two. He came home one day and my mother said to him, I don't think you're very happy. So uh, he said, well, he said, I'm not. So she said, well, what do you want to do? What really do you want to do? So he said, I want to be a boxer. And he said, I'd like to go on the booths. Much to my mother's disgust, that was. But she gave in to him and said, right, if that's what you'd like to do, you do it. Try it and see how you get on. <coughs> In the Golden Gloves Club in Bournemouth, boys get stars in their eyes, not just from the odd punch on the nose, but from the thought of becoming a world champion like Freddie Mills. He never had the money to go in, and he used to peep in this end and that end, and because I could get after him in them in them days, so I goes and I hits him, hits him really hard, and he said, "All right." He said, "I should do it again." I said, "Oh no, you won't." I said, "We're going to get a boy for you next week, and you're going to fight in that ring." So I said to my husband, "I said, he won't come back no more." I told him he got to fight in the ring next week. But anyway, Freddie came back, and uh, we put him, I said, oh, don't let him get hurt, you know, so don't put him on with anybody who's just hurt him. But when he got in the ring, he nearly killed the boy that we put him on. <laughs> he seemed to be very happy. He's doing quite well. I mean, he was boxing with Gypsy Daniels, and 
Jimmy Jory and a few of the others, you're picking up, you know, a few shilling sort of thing and then rang with your hat for the nobbins and share eating under the ring, probably even sleeping under the ring at times. It was a real tough existence. I remember once he came back with two black eyes and a cauliflower ear. Well, it wasn't really a cauliflower ear, it was, his ear was all swollen up. And we had to go and get these leeches, I yeah, think, from Bridges, wasn't it, the yeah, chemist? The chemist yeah. And I used to have to go up and get them and and place them on his ear so that they'd suck all the blood out. Sometimes you'd have 24 rounds in a day. You know, from dinner time to night time. Some of the places where we open about 2 o'clock, you'd have 24 rounds. Now, you've seen many fighters. How did he compare with the many others you've had here? Well, I didn't like didn't like his fighting myself. How he used to shape up and that, as I say, he was too short for his weight, and uh, it didn't look nice in the ring. The other fellow wouldn't be heavier than him, but uh, it always looked awkward. And Fred used to have to sort of jump, and he'd have to do it as quick as he could, the first round of it. So, I mean, he wasn't really pleasing. To my idea, not pleasing to me anyway. Not everyone agreed, especially at the Westover Ice Rink in Bonn, a scene of many of Freddie Mills' early successes. An amateur boxer of those days, Peter McKinnis, was both a friend of Freddie's and a fan. In all, I saw him here in 49 bouts, and he used to pack this place every second Wednesday. He was a real crowd pleaser Freddie in those days well he always was a crowd pleaser he would never fail to force the fight from the first bell now when I say force the fight I don't mean go tearing in he had this wonderful aggressive style tin tucked behind his shoulder like this and somehow this is not a correct boxing stance for far from it but from that stance Freddie learned to left hook it was a natural punch my mother didn't like him boxing at all but he went to the Westover Ice Rink and saw them advertising for novice competitions. They had to, I think they had to box three one minute rounds, wasn't it? Yes. And uh, in the end they'd win this Rose Bowl if they won. No money attached to it, but they won the Rose Bowl in the end. Well, to enter, he put his name in as Freddie Mills of Parkson so that my mother shouldn't know anything about it. What happened in that first bout uh, both the novices, and I just, the name of the opponent escapes me, but the first bell went. They rushed from their corners and collided, and the opponent fell down and thought it was better not to get up. And Freddie was the winner. By the late 30s, Freddie's fame was spreading beyond the South. But war service in the RAF broadened his horizons and made him a national figure. The RAF encouraged him to keep up his professional career. And by 1942, he was ready to challenge for the British and Empire light heavyweight titles. The championship fight at the Spurs football ground resulted in a sensational win for Sergeant Freddie Mills of the RAF over pilot officer Len Hardy. That veteran, who was having his first fight for three years, had put his world, British and Empire light heavy or cruiserweight titles at stake. 22-year-old Freddie Mills of Bournemouth meant to have them. And he did, in spite of all the great experience and ring craft of the smiling Hardy. Movie dance film shows you how it was done as clearly as if it had been one of the 25,000 spectators. Nice punches, even if they weren't very damaging. Round two, and only 58 seconds to go. So watch carefully if you want to see how Len Hardy received his first knockout, the first in all the years of his fighting career. You may not be able to see the short left that connected with Harvey's jaw. Harvey didn't, but he put the Cornishman down for a count of nine. When Harvey got up, he was obviously groggy, and as anyone could see, his usual masterly defense had gone with the wind. Any second now, it'll be goodbye. the ring, off the press table, onto the grass, and pandemonium. <laughs> the 
clambering back into the ring, Hardy got a warm welcome back to the land of the living from the new champion. By now, Freddie had joined one of the best-known managers in the country, Ted Broadrib. Broadrib's daughter, Chrissy, later to become Mrs. Freddie Mills, was then married to another fighter, Don McCorkingdale. Chrissy even appeared in a Morning, boxing newsreel. Bring your baby, Dalton. Chrissy already had a young son, Donnie, long before she even knew the man who was to become her second husband. Well, I went to Leicester with my parents for an August bank holiday weekend. Uh, that was during the war, uh, 1941, I think. It, yes, it was 1941. And Donnie was a little boy. And he fought Tommy Reddington. And I was introduced to him after the fight because my father was there he was with the intention of managing him. You know, sort of talk, negotiation was going on. Uh, that was the first time. And what did you think of him then? I thought he was rather nice. He was quite a comedian. Was he? And had had my uh, little son, who was then two, in hysterics with his antics. And th that was his character, of course, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, he was a fun man all the time. He was lovable, a very affectionate person himself. What can I say? He was a very, very vivacious person. He didn't walk anywhere. He flew. Freddie's courage and all-out aggression in the ring soon began to earn him an international reputation. Freddie Mills wasted no time in going for Al Delaney in their ten-round heavyweight contest at the Albert Hall. Sergeant Freddie Mills of the RAF is the shorter of the two and wears a stripe on his pants. He's British cruiserweight champion. Al Delaney is the Canadian heavyweight champion. He had over a stone advantage in weight, but that didn't seem to have any effect on Mills, who kept up a non-stop barrage throughout the battle. Uppercut, jab, wings, haymakers. He even tried a little overarm bowling. The result was a knockdown followed by a knockout. Did you ever see Freddie fight? Uh, once. I saw him fight Jock McAvoy at the Royal Albert Hall. And I, I was not a wearer of hats at all, but I thought, well, I'm ringside, I will lash out. And I went and I bought myself a stunning hat, which at the time, four and a half guineas, was a lot of money. And all I did during this fight was rip this four and a half guinea hat to pieces. And a friend of my father's who I'd sat next to, Jimmy Murphy, bless him, from Birmingham, he's dead now. He said to my father, Ted, he said, for Christ's sake, don't sit me next to her again. He said, I am black and blue from here to here. It was soon Freddie's turn to be black and blue, when in 1946 he took on the world light heavyweight champion from America, Gus Lesnovich. This was the first major promotion after the war, promoted by the great Jack Solomon, the late great Jack Solomon, at Haringey Arena. Freddie had just been demobbed from the Air Force, uh, and furthermore, he had just very recently come home from the East. Um, from India actually and there was no question that his blood had been affected by the tropics. The master ceremony introduces the principal, Gus Lesnovich of America. Freddie was as fit as he could possibly be um, in the circumstances. Now, the story of the fight is both a wonderful one and a tragic one, because in the first round, um, things were fairly quiet, but in the second round, Freddie got into serious trouble. The first of many shows yet to come in this round. Just after the war, people were hungry for entertainment. Freddie Mills never failed to provide it. As long as you could stomach the degree of punishment which was then thought acceptable. And down he goes again, this time to the right cross of the draw. Both of 
Dallas immediately rushes in to try and kill off Mills with a series of blows to the head and body. Almost out on his feet, Teddy Mills goes down again. In this day and age, the fight would probably have been stopped. However, in his concussed state from the third round onwards, he reverted to a boxing style that was completely foreign to him. He used a wonderful left hand. He won every round from then until the 10th round. And he made Gus Lezimich in a most terrible state with two cut eyes, a badly broken nose, and all sorts of other injuries. And Freddie Mills looked a certain winner. Some argue that the beating Freddie took in this fight was to have fatal consequences later. But he built an after-dinner speech round it. Well, I found every member laughing me head off at anything that ever happened in the ring. <laughs> well, there I was, up and down like a yo-yo in the second round. And then I don't remember what happened, what it was all about, until Ted Broderick was pulling my head, shaking my head, and he said, Freddie, he said, this is the tenth round coming up. The tenth round, I thought. What's this all about? And he said, yes, he said, I think you're winning on points. So I thought, well, who am I? What am I doing here? You know, sort of <laughs> Well, the tenth round coming up, I now go out fully conscious of what's going on to murder the guy when bop, bop, bop. Fred's down on the floor again. The typical of the British doctor, up he got again. Strange and sad to relate, in the interval between the ninth and tenth round, the concussion seemed to clear. And in the tenth round, Freddie was ready to his old start. Right crosses and left hooks, and finally Mills goes down for the second round. Of course, I used to fight better in the semi-conscious state. <laughs> There's a which caught him again, and referee Eugene Henderson stopped the fight just a few seconds off the end of the tenth and final yeah. round. Gus Lezovich, the new cruiserweight champion of the world. Now, it's my opinion that Freddie Mills never fully recovered from the injuries sustained in that fight. Certainly, for a spell, he had terribly bad headaches, um, and he had some trouble with his vision. Now, the truth of the matter is that three weeks to the day after that terrific fight with Lezovich, one of the most punishing ever seen in this country, he was in the ring in the same arena, Haringey, a 12-round fight against Bruce Woodcock, the heavyweight champion. Despite their recent defeats at the hands of American boxers, a capacity house at the Haringey Arena fully justifies promoter Jack Solomon's judgment in staging a match between Britain's leading heavyweight Bruce Woodcock and Freddie Mills. Tonight, both men are in the pink of condition, and Mills, although giving away nearly a stone, proved in his fight against Lesnovich that he could take a lot of punishment and hand it up. There goes the bell for round one. There's plenty of excitement in the first minute. Mills gets right to work with his famous swinging left, but see for yourself. Our roving camera takes time out to catch Tom Wall. And then back to the ring with our slow motion camera. Now you can see every detail of what's happening. After the pounding he received from Lesnovich, today Freddie Mills would never have been allowed to fight again in three weeks. The danger was compounded by matching him with Woodcock, a much heavier man, because Freddie had run out of opponents in the light heavyweight division. Back to normal speed again, and you can see what speed. Ooh, I can almost feel that one myself. There's the finish, and without a second hesitation, the young raises Woodcock's hand, and Woodcock is the winner. And while the crowd cheers Bruce Woodcock, for yet another great victory, they also give a big hand to Freddie Mills as game of fighters as they make them. In his private life, Freddie had by now set up home with Chrissy McCorkingdale. Her son, Donnie, was already on the best of terms with his new stepfather. He was a man's man. Women found him very, very attractive. Because whenever we were in a social gathering, he was always surrounded with women as opposed to men. Um, happy-go-lucky, um, but with a sense of responsibility for his new family, by me and my mother. 
Freddie's wedding was conventional enough, but nothing else was. We were married in the September and we finally made the honeymoon in January. Joining Freddie on his honeymoon was the very man whose wife he'd pinched, Don McCorkingdale. We were all at in the Barberton Plaza Hotel in Cape Town and um, Freddie and I were on one floor and Big Don and Little Donnie were on the floor above. And we used to just yell at each other, you know, their balcony was right above us. It was a very unusual idea, though, going on well, with your ex -husband. Well, of course, and, and at that time, all those years ago, we were, I suppose, rather an oddity, the three of us. Chrissy was able to capture husbands one and two on honeymoon with Freddie's new cine camera. He was a great home movie enthusiast, and I think the, the family thing with him comes out in, in the home movies. He was a great cameraman, but whenever anybody else but was behind the camera, immediately um, a show had to be put on. I can't, can't remember where he got it from, but all of a sudden there were sheets appearing, um, sandals and umbrellas and galoshes, and everybody was, was dressed up. But... beginning to move towards show business and a great friend from those days was Dickie Henderson. Well, he was just a nice guy. He was a total nice guy. He was a gentle giant. Well, giant's the wrong word because he was never more than a light heavyweight. He fought heavyweights. He fought giants. One was Joe Baxey, another mismatch against a much bigger man. And there's the bell for round one. Well, as you probably know, this is the only round of the fight in which Mills manages to return much of the treatment which the much bigger and heavier Baxley hands up. Baxley tips the scales almost two stone more than Mills. He's three inches taller than Freddie, and his reach is three inches longer, which means that Mills is up against a really tough proposition. However, if there's one thing Mills has got, it's lots of grit. The Baxley fight provided instant entertainment for those who liked to see Freddie's courage tested beyond reasonable limits. He, however, turned it to witty advantage in later years. This rang a bell with me right away, which is nothing unusual, because I often hear bells. <laughs> but it rang a bell, it rang a bell, and reminded me of the seconds in my corner, the night I fought that big American fella, Joe Baxey. There I was, sat in the corner, blood all over the place. <laughs> all mine. <laughs> And a second, a second looked down at me and he smiled so sweetly, these seconds do, you know. And he said, don't worry, Freddy, just stand up, boy, say, you'll think of something. <laughs> well, well, of course I didn't. <laughs> and I got a bloody good hiding. <laughs> Paving the way for the time when he could no longer fight, Freddie put his money into a Chinese restaurant in the Charing Cross Road in London. But Mills the fighter was not finished yet. On the 26th of July, 1948, he met Gus Lesnovich for the second time. Well, the night that he won the world title at, at White City was a fantastic night. It was a night of boxing such as you don't see today.
he was so popular, he always used to say, by the time I get in the ring, he said, I've gone three rounds, everybody's patting me on the back and saying, good old Freddy, he said, I'm bruised. Solomons was a great promoter, and he had something to work with in Freddie Mills. come out of the blackness of the war, people were, were depressed with the rationing and they needed a hero and Freddie fulfilled that. The fight opened sensationally. With Gus apparently going for a quick decision, Freddie fought back fiercely and cut the champion over both eyes. spectacular as compared with the first meeting with Lesnovich. But the thing which made it what it was, was the, was the bated breath of the thousands and thousands of people that were there, willing Freddie to win. When Walton raised, raised his, hat, his hand at the end of 15 rounds, the place just absolutely erupted. It's 45 years since the last Englishman won the world light heavy title. There were people crying, people standing on their seats. It was a, it was a wonderful occasion because they all knew that Freddie Mills then was where he should be, the champion of the world. Drive on the old 6-5. We were trying to do a program that would be of interest to a vast range of people, grown-ups, kids, all kinds of things, and we thought we'd put a sports item in. Interview with, um, oh, I don't know, I mean, today you would want an interview with McEnroe or something like that, and Freddie Mills was the guy to do it. He knew the sports, he knew sportsmen, he had all the contacts, and he was very, very good at him. Both as a boxer and as a song and dance man, Freddie Mills made up for lack of finesse by sheer dynamism. I'm from he was popular with everybody. I always used to think that Fred Mills, I, I didn't know Cassius Clay or anybody like that, but I did know Freddie Mills, and it didn't matter where we went in the world, everybody knew him, and that was because he was the world champion. Freddie's last fight was in 1950 when he defended his world light heavyweight title against the American Joey Maxim. Europe and probably the world were the main bout worthy of the occasion. It's a Jack Solomon's night of night with 18,000 fans waiting to see Freddie Mills of Britain, light heavyweight champion of the world, defend his title against American challenger Joey Maxim, brought over by Doc Kearns, maker of champions. As a man, and as a sportsman, and as a gentleman, Freddie was one of the greatest that ever lived. As a fighter, it is my firm belief that had it not been for the war, Freddie Mills would have always been a middleweight, and would have been one of the great middleweights of all time. As the bell goes for round one, we see the Mills plan go into action, all out for a quick kill. If it comes to boxing and the fight goes the distance, strong as he is, Freddie knows that he hasn't a real chance. Tough, rugged, a fighter, pure and simple. He faces in Maxim a thorough craftsman. It looks a good gamble. Britain's Mills bomb against America's Maxim gun. Freddie was certainly past his best. He was outboxed. He gave a very good account of himself. Raymond Glendinning probably never had a more anxious audience in all his fight broadcasts as Freddie came up for round 10. Now it's nearly the end. Mills has had three of his front teeth removed between rounds. 
baneful proof of the venom in Maxim's country. Now he's swallowing blood all the time. Breathing is difficult. Every blow on the mouth is sheer agony. In the tenth round, Freddy caught a punch in the way that no fighter likes to catch them. Uh, Maxim was clever enough to time his right as Freddy walked in. And therefore the force of the blow was, was treble. It was the fail. A short, perfectly timed right cross to the side of the face did the damage, and referee Andy Smythe raises the hand of the new light heavyweight champion of the world, Jerry Maxim. Freddie Mills never had much time for the gentle art of self-defense. His all-out attack and damn the consequences meant he took some devastating punishment. And this time he decided enough was enough. The teeth may have needed fixing, but the personality was as scintillating as ever. And Freddie began his transformation from boxer, pure and simple, to popular entertainer. He enlivened the drabness of post-war Britain with exhibition matches and an irresistible gift for clowning. And just to prove how tough wrappings can be, they defied ex-world champion Freddie Mills to punch his way out of a paper bag. But Freddie seemed quite cheerful about the apparent loss of his renowned punching power. <laughs> yeah, it was a tough fight, Mum. But don't worry, it was in the bag. <laughs> Wherever he went, it was just comedy and fun all the time. He always used to take us to the zoo nearly every week, Battersea Park, to the fun fair. He always used to take us to lots of shows and we'd always go backstage afterwards, which was a great thrill for me and friends that he would take along. And whenever we were in the park, he was always the one that would get all the other kids involved and he was, well, Lots of the neighbours used to call him the Pied Piper. Where other people felt like dancing in the streets, Freddie went one better. He lent his name to a boys' club which is still thriving. His hometown of Bournemouth honoured him with the freedom of the borough. An attempt to give him television's ultimate accolade almost collapsed when he found out and vetoed it. flew into the kitchen and he said, this is your life, for me, I don't want any part of it. I said, but why not? He said, no. He said, I'm, I, he said I can be such a bad-tempered bee, he said, that I couldn't stand sitting there having people say, well, a lovely fellow I am. They postponed the program, bided their time, and got their man in the end. Ready. Derek, it isn't it amazing that you arrived here tonight? We were just talking about you. The very man we were talking no. because tonight, Freddie Mills, this You're is joking. your life. I remember thinking, why wouldn't he stay down? On my right at 175 pounds, flown across the Atlantic. No. Again tonight, <laughs> Gus Lesnovich. <laughs> Of course he did. Former <laughs> light heavyweight champion. Now he was really a great fighter this fellow. <laughs> Him too. <laughs> he had to be. He beat me. And you know, Freddie, I'm still waiting for a return match. <laughs> <laughs> Boxing's not everybody's cup of tea, but any man who fights with honor to the top of his profession is worthy of respect. Now many of us can say in our own spheres, I was the best in the world. Freddie Mills, this is your life. Thank you very much, Amy. And at this point, Freddie was a hero, because he was one of the great extrovert, wonderfully courageous boxers that uh, I think this country's ever had. Freddie was a very generous man. He was a marvelous companion. He can tell you stories about his show business experience and all sorts of things. Great man to be with, great fun to be with. I think it was because he was so natural. There were no tricks or anything. He was a very, very sincere person. And um, if he liked somebody, he really liked them. He loved Alfred Marks and Paddy. Paddy used to say to him, oh, he's bloody starstruck, that one. I 
hearts to recall that even now, when time has passed, I only long Cause I could not bring myself to try He really was a nice guy. I, I don't know how he ever stirred up enough anger to be a successful champion boxer. I mean, his business was punching the daylights out of people. And yet, he was a guy who wouldn't hurt a fly. He really wouldn't hurt a fly. Then Freddie's place in the sun was darkened by tragedy. The singer Michael Holliday was a friend from 6-5 Special. In the web of coincidence linking them, Freddie was later to spend his last hours in the same place as Holliday. Michael Holliday was in our club the night that he took his life and Freddie talked to him for hours and he said that if could Michael had said that he was going to finish it that night he could not go on so I went up to see how they were getting on and I heard Freddie saying to him Michael your life is not yours to take your mother gave you your life you mustn't think of doing anything like that he said, think what it would do to her. That was just a uh, snatch of the conversation that I heard. So I knew that Freddie was very, very involved and, you know, concerned about the man. However, the next thing I know, he's disappeared. He's gone. He left the club. The newspapers reflected the shock felt at Holiday's suicide. Within two years, readers were to be equally stunned by Freddie's own mysterious death. But meanwhile, he had changed the Chinese restaurant he owned in Soho into a nightclub. It was a period when the Soho protection racket had become a national scandal. Nipper Reed, who in later years was to reinvestigate Freddie's death, is famous for bringing the Cray twins to justice. As far as the gangs were concerned, Soho was a kind of an open city in the sense that, that whilst there was a very uh, obvious domination in the East End by the Crays and equally a domination by the Richardson gang in, in South London, Soho was not dominated by one particular gang. These two, you couldn't mistake them, they were so alike, you knew that they were twins. They always had the same table on the edge of the dance floor and Freddie used to go and talk to them. Now this particular night, Freddie was at the table and I called him over. So I said to him, I said, do you know these two fellas, Freddie? He said, yes, he said they used to be boxers at the Solomon Boys Club. So I said, well, I know, you told me all that. I said, and you were their hero? And he said, yes. I said, well, Nick has just told me that they are the head of everything that's rotten in London. And he put his two hands and covered mine and he said, oh, mummy, he said, don't be so silly. He said, they're lovely boys. So he went back to the table and I'm behind the counter and he is talking to them but facing me at the same time. And I was absolutely horrified to see him say to them, what do you think my missus has just said to me? That you two are the heads of everything rotten in London. And I nearly died. I was so frightened. I said to Mark, the boy behind the mouth, oh, what would you do with him? I said, he's so silly. Why did he go and do that? Came back, threw his head back, and he was screaming, laughing. He said, oh, mummy, I told you. They said, you, Fred, never would hurt you. But the club was in financial trouble, and there was a scandal over hostesses doubling as call girls. For Freddie and his partner, Andy Ho, they were anxious times. What um, went wrong with the club? Well, in club business, he has his spasms, you see. He's not, you, at, at one period, you would be very busy, and then sometimes you get a terribly slack. And with heavy overheads, you've got to be, uh, really you have financial reserves. But the overheads is so heavy, you have no financial reserves. Whatever crisis point Freddie Mills had reached, he kept it to himself. To the family, even on their last day together, he seemed his old self. 
That night the Beatles were on and he, I said that the children had got to go to bed and he pleaded with me. He said, Mummy, he said, it finishes at 10 o'clock. Let them stay up. I said, all right. So he bathed them and they were all in the lounge watching the Beatles. At 10 o'clock they came out to me in the kitchen and they were twisting and dancing and they went up to bed and at half 10 he left for the club. What was his manner like that night when he came to the club? Uh, I want to say now, didn't he? He was slightly, you know, sad and unhappy, like, you know. Was he? Mm. What, did, was he morose and didn't speak? Rather, yes, yes. Not like uh, any other time. Usually he comes in, slaps me on the back and laugh and cheerful, but that night was slightly thinking hard and brooding all the time, you see. Did you speak to him? I did ask him once or twice. It's first wrong, Freddy. He just goes like this, wins his face and didn't say anything, you know. So he's just pacing up and down the passage, you see. This is Goslick Yard. It's a small and rather squalid cul-de-sac just off the Charing Cross Road. And in those days, in 1965, uh, not many people would have come round here or even known about it. But one who did was Freddie Mills. And what he used to do was park his car here, and when business was slack in the club, the club was just on the other side of this building on the main Charing Cross Road, he'd come out here and have a sleep in the car. And on the night of the 24th of July, 1965, he apparently came out here to do just that. But on that occasion, it ended in tragedy. Told only that Freddie was ill, Chrissy hurried to the West End. She had no idea that Freddie was lying in his car with a bullet through the right eye. Well, when I arrived at the club, Andy was waiting out. Andy was the partner, Freddie's partner. He was waiting outside the club for me. And I wasn't on very good terms with Andy. I hadn't been speaking to him. And when I, as I got out of the car, he came towards me and took my arm. My mother got out of the car and I saw Andy had to take it to one side and say something and I said to Kevin, what's going on? And I got out of the car and he said to me, look, Freddie, we think is Freddie is ill. He said, Chris, he said, I want you to come to Freddie's car. And then he, I said, what, what's that? What's, what's the matter? He said, well, if we can't waken him. So I allow him to lead me down the side up into Goblet Yard to where Freddie was in the car. It was very dark at the back there. I think it was one street lamp. And the car was away from the street lamp. Um, and I looked in the rear window and I saw him sitting in his usual position that he took when he was asleep, which was totally relaxed, with his hands on his knees and his head on his chest, like that. And I said, Freddie, Freddie, you're all right. And there was no response. And it was then, I think, I think you know if the spark of life has gone from somebody. It was it was that immediate. I knew that the man was dead. I'd been there about four or five, ten minutes, and an ambulance arrived. And I said, but where's the police? And, and they said, well, we've been called, and we, we better take him. I said, no, don't take him, because, you know, it's got to be... Before I knew what was happening, they bundled him out of the car onto a stretcher into the ambulance and away. I woke up in the morning looked under the bed where I had a little transistor radio that had gone. I went downstairs, no papers were there, and, and there was this really strange atmosphere in the house. And then Don, my brother, took us into the front room with my sister and my mother, and he said, Daddy isn't going to be coming home anymore. This is what I remember, and I remember saying, why, where's he gone? And I, I can't remember much after that, it was just a a bit of a day is that day, but that night I remember thinking about everything that had happened and thinking, oh, on the very, his very last day I didn't let him know how much I loved him. Millions who had loved him as the embodiment of courage and good humour joined in national mourning. As the sense of shock faded, the attempt began and it continues to this day to make sense of the riddle of his death. Jack Solomon had warned me of this, even the day after Freddie, you know, this all happened. 
he came to see me and he said, Chrissy, he said, if Freddie Mills stood here in front of me and said, Jack, I shot myself, he said, I still wouldn't believe it. He said, but be prepared, girl. He said, because I think they may try and bring this in as suicide. I wanted, like so many other people, to find an alternative. I wanted to believe that a man like Freddie Mills wouldn't commit suicide. But at the end of the investigation, I was forced to the inescapable conclusion that the only possibility was that he did in fact commit suicide. Police suspicions were confirmed when the coroner brought in a verdict of suicide. But the family dispute it still, and cast doubt in particular on the way Freddie is supposed to have come by the instrument of his death, a fairground rifle. A woman who ran a shooting gallery at Battersea Funfair told the coroner that Freddie had borrowed it to take to a fate. She's no longer alive, so her evidence can't be checked. The family think it was rubbish. It's like a, a, a bad detective story. We need, at this point, somebody to supply a gun. On the first occasion, you'll remember that he borrowed a rifle from a friend of his who had a fairground uh, shooting gallery and then took it back some four days later and then borrowed it again. I think the reason that he took it back in the first place was that he didn't have any cartridges. But on the second occasion, uh, I'm, sh I'm satisfied that he stole uh, some cartridges from the mantelpiece of the flat of the woman that lent him the rifle, and there he was then equipped with the weapon and the means to kill himself. If one is going to kill oneself, I think, you, you, you're far more circumspect than this, because apparently, he went to a, the lady who owned a, a shooting gallery at Battersea Farm Fair. He went to this lady, whom he knew. I didn't know her. And I, got, I worked at Battersea Park on the rides, on the fun fairs. I didn't know. I'd never seen him before. I've no doubt that that happened. I've no doubt that he borrowed the rifle. And uh, I, I'm then convinced that, that he made the decision that he wanted to kill himself and, and did what eventually we found happened. What did happen in Freddy's Citroen that night is still the subject of interpretations that can't be reconciled. This is a 2-2 repeater fairground rifle identical to the kind that killed Freddie Mills. Now, according to the family, they found him in the back seat with the rifle propped against his leg, his hands on his knees like this and his head slumped forward. And they say that if he killed himself like this, the rifle pointing across the back of the front seat, the rifle would have fallen from his grasp and slithered down the front seat. But it must be said that there is another possible explanation. He could have decided to shoot himself from this position, with the butt of the rifle resting on the back of the driver's seat. If that had happened, it's possible that the rifle could have just fallen to his side in that way, and his hands ended up on his knees like that in the position in which he was found. However, Donnie McCorkingdale, Freddie Mills' stepson, has another theory. I think he was inside the car, sitting in the back seat, in his usual position where he went to sleep. And I think the assailant was outside the car with the rear driver's window rolled down, and I think he was shot through the window. And then the, the scene stage managed from there, because he was known to spend a lot of his time, well not a lot of his time, but he had a regular routine when it wasn't busy in the club. He would go and catch a cat nap. But it was stated at the inquest by his partner Andy Ho that that didn't take place, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, for what reason, I don't know. Because Andy Ho also, I worked for the club for a year and I knew Freddie, both Freddie and Andy Ho to take catnaps in their cars in Gosley Yard. Some people have said that it was a normal thing for him to sleep in the car around in Goslett Yard, uh, but I believe you say different. You said different at the inquest. When did I say? What did I say? Didn't you say that it wasn't his habit to sleep in the car? That I cannot remember. Yeah. That I cannot remember, and I cannot remember whether it is his habit to sleep in the car either. The main thing that, that makes me believe that he was murdered was that two weeks prior to his death, a, an ex-wrestler who'd um, opened a Keep Fit Club 
not too far from Freddy's night spot, was approached by a minion. Now, which gang he represented, I don't know. Um, for protection money. And the guy, in no uncertain terms, told the bloke to leave him alone. And there's no way he was going to get protection money out of him. And the, uh, the criminal's parting shot to the ex-wrestler was, well, if you're not paying now, you certainly will pay. Because something's going to happen to make you think twice. And two weeks later, Freddie was dead. If he were set up, as it were, as an example to others, then, again, because of his background and personality, because he was a nationally known figure, then somebody would have been aware of that. There would have been some kind of rumour in the underworld that, that Freddie Mills was set up for the example. And in fact, amongst other club owners, amongst other restaurant owners, they would have, the finger would have, have pointed if you don't knuckle under and do what we want you to, that's what could happen to you. Look at Freddie Mills. And that was never the case. That sort of rumour, that sort of intelligence never seeped back. It has been sort of mentioned in certain quarters that the reason that he so-called killed himself were money worries, an old affair with a, a younger woman, and... Um, physical damage he sustained during the, what, his career as a fighter. Well, as for the, as for the, the affair, it was an old affair. It, it petered out long before Freddie was murdered. There was one time when I said that he should go to her. And, you know, I'd give him six months because I couldn't see it lasting anyway because she was so much younger. I said, if at the end of six months there's no go, you know I'm here, I shall be here. And when I gave him that ultimatum, that was when it started to fizzle out with the other person. Freddie's last ride to the club left the family not only grief-stricken, but nearly bankrupt. Where all the money had gone is as mystifying as the way Freddie behaved when he's supposed to have been contemplating suicide. In the morning, he had started to empty the pool. Also, he had bought the week's supply of cigarettes for both of us. Now, that's hardly conducive to a man who's going to take his life, is it? And I think that if he had taken his life, he would have left a note of some kind of explanation. If not to me, he would have pursued, and I'm sure of it. My view is that when people do something like this, there, there's always, right up to the last minute, the feeling that they don't have to do it, that they may not need to do it, and suddenly uh, they do it and, and there's no note, and there's this then uh, added mysterious factor that, that can be associated with the death. The terrible thing about it is that you can't believe that he would do that. I mean, how can you... How can you have a fighter like Mills, who would go into the ring, and under no circumstances would he ever give up? He would not give up, no matter how tough the going was. Now, how can a man like that give up in life? That nobody can understand. I don't know what the explanation was. I wouldn't like to say, but I'm quite sure he didn't kill himself. Quite sure. Because there have been all sorts of things that he could have been a bit depressed about, business worries, or he had a girlfriend, and all these kind of things. Do you think they add up to a possible suicide cause? I think even if all those things were true, it didn't add up to killing himself. Never. He had too much resilience. He'd been... I mean, he wasn't a man who was always up. I mean, he'd won fights, he'd lost fights. He'd had a lot of money, he'd had a little bit of money. And... Um, that wasn't the sort of action he would take as a solution to a problem. He wasn't a quitter. He was not a quitter. Was he a quitter? You don't get to be world champion if you're a quitter, do you? And he was a world champion. Oh, boy. It really is irrelevant now whether it was suicide or whether he was killed, as some people think that is the case because whatever happened, it will never bring him back.
enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Praise Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.